Well, Glory, this is Dudley Hall. Great to be back with you again last month of this year. Wow, approaching the Christmas season. And I'm glad because it's good to be reminded that Jesus is with us, that he loved us enough, delighted in us enough that he came from heaven to be with us. What a thought. Uh, hey, as we, uh, as we come to the end of the year, if you uh, haven't made your end of the year contributions yet, can I ask you to consider us seriously? Would you help us? Would you help us uh, make up for losses that this economic turmoil of this year has made? And would you help us move forward with confidence? We're, we're, we're going ahead with more enthusiasm than we've had forever. So, uh, so it's, it's, going to, it's going to be good. People need the gospel. Jesus deserves us proclaiming him, and I need you. I need you to help us. So thank you for listening. Thank you for participating. Thank you for being generous. Please uh, please respond by making a, a generous contribution, investment in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, so uh, as we close out the year, there's something I want to talk to you about that's really, really serious get to it in a minute, but I wanted to recommend something to you here. Uh, last year, first of last year, I spent a week putting together what I would call the foundations of the gospel. Uh, the name of our ministry is Kerygma Ventures. Kerygma is the announcement of the essentials of the gospel. This is the content of that. So there's several hours here, uh, video and audio of what, what the gospel is all about, the whole thing. And so I want to recommend that to you. Uh, call the office, go on the website. While you're doing that, uh, let me remind you of some things. In January, we're doing uh, our annual Leadership Expedition Alumni Retreat. We'll do that at the ranch, Tresor Escondido. And that, that's 15th, 16th, 17th of January. And so if you know an LE alumni that maybe not be aware of this or hadn't been planned to come, remind them to come. Uh, it's wonderful getting all these guys together after we've been doing this 25 years. So we get guys who went through it the first year and guys who've gone through it during the, and they get together and it's fun watching them and it's fun learning from them. In February, we have the uh, annual father daughter retreat, which is a great delight. That's the weekend of the 17th, 17, 18, 19. Daughters need to be 15 and up. Men can be whatever age they are. And it doesn't have to be a biological daughter. We have guys every year who bring someone they've adopted to be their daughter for the weekend. It is a fabulous weekend of uh, affirmation and delight. And then in March, the big conference that we do every year, the big, the biggie called Epic Conference. It'll be at Sojourn Church. That'll be the facility. It'll be March four, five, six, seven. And uh, you need to register for that. Uh, there is a cost. There are meals provided and all kind of stuff. So it will be uh, it will be on identifying the narratives that compete with the narrative. Because Epic's always about the story, and so there's something provided as far as plenary sessions, and then there are breakout sessions, and it's for everybody. So uh, please take advantage of all those opportunities. Great way of moving along in our journey with the, with the Lord. Okay, so we have just been through the last year or so a major political uh, upheaval, if you will. Uh, there's just been a lot of added to the COVID-19 uh, situation uh, and the political situation had been very confusing to a lot of people. And one of the things that time has, has done is it's revealed how, how many holes are in our perspective of what it means to be a citizen of both the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this earth. Uh, I, I've been uh, flabbergasted, amazed at the lack of understanding of what it means to be in both. And so that's what I want to talk to you about this, this, this time. You say, well, hey, the political season's over. No, it isn't. It's always going on. And uh, 
So we go, we go, we're not just going to talk about politics, but we're going to talk about being citizens of two kingdoms and how one does not cancel out the other, but uh, how they augment each other and what's our responsibility there. So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, turn with me over to uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2 is going to be our text. And I'll read that to you, and then I want to talk, I want to kind of give you a context of it here. So all, all that's really, really important. So here we go. First uh, Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and exiles to abstain from the desires of the flesh that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that though they malign you as evildoers, they may see your honorable deeds and glorify God when he comes to judge. For the, for the Lord's sake, accept the authority of every human institution or every institution ordained for human beings. Another way to translate that. For the Lord's sake, Accept the authority of every human institution, whether of the emperor as supreme or of governors as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and praise those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing right, you should silence the ignorance of the foolish. As slaves of God, live as free people. Yet do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. Honor everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. So he's talking here. This is the text where he's talking about kind of the outworking of what it means to be a citizen of both. So let's talk about it. The, the book of Peter, this letter that Peter wrote to, to, to these believers who were scattered throughout uh, the region, scattered throughout mostly of, of Asia. Many of them were Jews who had come to faith in Christ and realized that they were now part of another nation. Uh, and some of them are Gentiles. But even the Gentiles are familiar with the Jewish story. So he's writing and is using a lot of Old Testament language and identities and parallels and references as he deals with the whole thing. Now, here's what's happened. These people have been born again, born of the Spirit, born from heaven. They've received the seed of God into their being. They, they have this new life, this life that's characterized by resurrection, and uh, it, it's the life of Christ. So they have this life, but now they are out here living in a world that is persecuting them. The world doesn't understand them. The Romans are, I think they are subversive, think that they are trying to overthrow that kingdom because they talk about Jesus being Lord, not Caesar. And the Jews are, are, are persecuting them because this group says they are, they are not limited to the Old Testament revelation that Jesus has come to be the Messiah, the fulfillment of the promises that God made to Israel. And, and so both Jews and Romans are persecuting these groups. And he calls them the dispersia or the diaspora, the, the scattering of these people who were now the people of God representing him on the earth. So the whole book is about that. And so he has to deal with things like suffering and persecution and, and trouble because they have a resurrected, victorious Christ who lives in them. They have the king of glory that they're sharing his life, and yet they're catching it in the world. Their, their culture is putting pressure and stuff on them big time. So he is talking to them about how, how do you live as people who are born from above, yet assigned during this time to live on the earth? How do you live? What, 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 how, do you, how do you live in both? How do you take the reality of the first one and apply it to where you live now? And there have been lots of people who have misunderstood that through the years. And, and this last political cycle revealed it 
maybe as never before in my lifetime where people like, I'm a Christian, I can't do that. I don't want to get involved in politics or because I'm a Christian, I have to do this or have, or so, so there, there's a, and we believe the lie that you can't mix politics and religion. You, the, the, what a lie. You, you mix religion with everything in life because it's all about life. Uh, you know, you can't separate your citizen, uh, citizenship in this country from your relationship to God. That's foolish. That's a lie that was put out to try to get you uninvolved. So, uh, in the first couple of chapters here, first the verses that precede the text we read today, he, he has talked about several things. One is he's talked about how unusual a Christian is. They're crazy. Uh, it was back during this political deal when they were doing the uh, the hearings on judge uh, the new judge that uh, uh, I, one of the one of the ones who was not so far her said as talking about the judge Judge Barrett that was that she was a member she was a member of the Catholic and she was a member of a group in the Catholic people of praise and she called herself a handmaiden and you know some of the people in that group you know speak in tongues and uh so she's nuts is what the senator said she's crazy i i was watching and i was thinking you know that's one of the best compliments you could get as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven because you know what you represent a reality that People who are not in that reality don't even know exists. And so you might look crazy. Uh, every once in a while, somebody needs to call you crazy for the right reasons uh, in order for you to know that you really are a part of that kingdom. Uh, otherwise, maybe you're just fitting in too much. So uh, there, there's a verse over here I want to draw your attention. This is in chapter 1 and verse 8, and it describes the nature of these heaven-born, earth-bound people. He says, and although you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you're receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So, so he says, what do you do with these people who who love somebody they've never seen. I mean, love, the big word love, agape, who have given themselves totally, given their heart, given their life. They're totally captivated by this person they've never seen. And they trust in him, totally trust in someone they can't see now. They're crazy. They, 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 they live with a with a sense of reality that's beyond the scientific method. You, you can't observe it. You can't prove it. And in fact, that's a characteristic of someone who's born from heaven, but bound to earth. Bound for a while. That is this. They know something they can't prove, but they can't deny. And they operate in a joy that's indescribable and the treasure is unsearchable. That's the nature of a true Christian. Somebody's born from above. So, so that that's who we are. So we're we're people of faith, yes. But that's not a crazy thing. It's that we we just yeah we love somebody we've never seen, and we trust somebody we can't see now. But there's something, something has happened to us being captivated by His love that we have a joy we can't stop. It's inexpressible. We, we, we don't have enough words to talk about, to express it. It's inexpressible. And, and it's glorious, this joy, this, this thing that motivates us in the middle of everything, that gives us peace in the middle of a storm, that, that causes us to walk with confidence that we have somebody with us at all times, and that somebody is the Lord of glory. Uh, crazy people. And so... Uh, he goes on to talk about how we are, gives us some kind of identity. 
So it's really important to know who you are in this kingdom. So he uses some words that uh, it's not used all the time in this scripture, but it's uh, it's very typical of Peter, in particular this writing. He says, "Let me let me tell you who you are. You are uh, you are living stones in God's ultimate final temple." Now this meant something to those people because you see, if you were Jewish or you knew anything about the Jewish deal, the temple was was the greatest, the holiest, most important edifice in the world <clears throat> because it's where God, the God of the of the Bible, the God of history, had revealed himself, had come down and touched the earth. There was a holy place. It's where God met with man. And so everything surrounding the temple was holy, special. So a stone in that temple was of immeasurable value. I mean, what if a Jewish person could get one of the stones out of the temple and take it home? It'd take them a big cart, by the way. They were big stones. But what if you get a little piece of the stone and take it home? You're talking about a treasure. And yet Jesus says, let, let me tell you where you are in the story. Jesus is the cornerstone of that temple. There's not going to be any need for a, a physical temple in Jerusalem or anywhere else. There won't be a, a need for a place for God to come and meet with earth because he has done that in the person of Jesus Christ. So he is the cornerstone of this new temple. And so those who are interested in rebuilding the temple, uh, Jesus has already rebuilt it. And he's the cornerstone, and we are built on his foundation, which means we relate to him. And then we're related to each other as each of us is built as a living stone in that. that what he was saying was, you're precious. What he was saying was, you may be persecuted. The, the, the Romans may think you're a rebel and the Jews think you're crazy. But I, I'm telling you what God thinks. God thinks you're a living stone in his temple. You are most precious. He goes on to define some other stuff here. He says, you're a chosen race. Now remember, these are people who had Jewish background or at least knew about Jewish background and they realized, oh, what he's saying is there is an Israel that's beyond the old Israel. There, uh, you're a royal priest, priesthood. See, the Levites and uh, was, was a special tribe that had the priest, but he, even if you were a Levite, it didn't mean you, you could get to be a priest. The priests were very special because they're the ones who got to minister representing God to people and representing people to God. They're the ones who made the sacrifices. They're, 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 they're a very special, uh, special. He said, everybody's a priest now. Everybody who, who is in Christ is a priest. You are a priest. You, you don't have to call up the pastor, call up a staff member to get them to do something for you to help somebody get noble. Hey, you're a priest. You represent God. Uh, so, and, and then he says you're a holy nation. Uh, that you, You're part of a new nation now. That's what we're talking about. You're part of the kingdom of God. Born from heaven, but still here. And you're God's own people. God's people. You, you people who've come to faith in Christ, Jew and Gentile, you're God's people. It's not defined by race. It's not defined by ethnicity. It's not defined by geography. It's not defined by sex. It's not defined by social status. It's not defined by anything other than this. You've come to faith in Christ Jesus. So, uh, so all of this precedes our text. And if you don't understand who you are as a citizen of the kingdom of, of God, then you, you'll get confused and you won't know how to be a citizen of the earth, whatever country you live in, whatever your, uh, your kingdom is. So, uh, so this, this text that we've chosen today that we're dealing with here also gives you a, a, a definition of who you are. Because it uses two words here. I urge you as aliens and exiles. Okay. Uh, you're aliens. That, that, that is, you, you got a final home and a final address that's not here. You're exiles. You mean you're scattered. That, that, those words would have meant something to those people because they, Israel, had been 
exiles. They had traveled. They were they were nomads for, for a long time. They were exiles in a land, and the only uh, you know, only security they had was a pillar of fire during night and a pillar of cloud during the day that said God is with you and providing for you. And and so he says, you 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 like Israel are exiles with with even a greater promise that Jesus who has come and has fulfilled all the sacrifice, sacrificial uh, shadows of the Old Testament, he has come and he has defeated the enemy on the cross and he has defeated death and he's been raised from the grave. He's ascended to the right hand of the Father and he has sent the Holy Spirit who raised him from the dead to come and to live in, in you. And so now you are these people of God, and you are, yeah, you're exiles. You're walking through a land, but uh, you have somebody with you, and uh, he is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the New Testament name for God. In the Old Testament, his name was so holy, they didn't want to produce uh, pronounce it. Yahweh, Jehovah, we have those words. But in the New Testament, he's willing to pronounce it. You are the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says, you have that person who is walking with you and providing for you. So, so you're, you're uh, aliens and exiles. And here, here's how you live as an alien and an exile in this world. So he starts talking here about, the, uh, about our relationship to civil authority. Uh, by the way, oh yeah, before I put... But the text down here, I wanted to read uh, a passage you're probably familiar with. You've probably read it several times during the election process. It's, it's good to remind yourself what our role is. This is uh, Timothy, First uh, Timothy, chapter 2. First of all, then, I urge that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone for kings and all who are in high positions so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. Okay, so we're told again, you know, how we are to respect and react to, respond to civil authority. So uh, we are to, uh, to respect it, respect civil authority. Uh, why? Because, this text tells us this, because God has ordained civil authorities to be his instrument of ordering society. Therefore, to re disrespect this order this institution of God is to disrespect God. Uh, you, you don't have the option. You don't, have to, you don't get the option to say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm going to heaven, and I, I've been born of the Spirit, and uh, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. I don't, I don't have to do all that, all that stuff. Uh, there's a bunch of crooks in, involved in, in, in civil government, and, and, and uh, I, you know, I don't like it, and I, I don't want to do it. I'm free. Well, you're not free from respecting what God has instituted because God loves not only you, he loves his created order. And there are a lot of people who have not yet come to know him, but they've got to live in this created order and they've got to live with other people. And so God has said, I, 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 want, I want to bless the earth. I, I created the earth for it to, to be blessed. I still want it to be blessed. And I, I have created human institutions to uphold justice, to punish the wicked and reward the good. In other words, this order is to recognize that there is evil and that there is good and that, and that order is needed in order for people to flourish as humans and in their flourishing ultimately seek God. Because everything he does is designed so that he can he can know them all and and bless them all. So so we are to uh, we respect the institution as a as something God ordained, 
And then we're to respect the people in it for, not for their character or for their personality, but, but for their role. They are representing this institution that was designed for the promotion of and the upholding of, of justice. So uh, he, he goes on to here to say that our freedom, the freedom that we have as believers, is uh, empowers us to be servants. Now, this, this is an interesting thing here. This is 2 Peter chapter 1. I love this is verse 16. I don't know if you picked it up a while ago when we read it. It says, as slaves of God, live as free people. Is that a misprint? As slaves, live as free people. You see, God set you free so you could serve and submit to something lesser. It is our service that proves that we know we're free. See, if you don't know you're free and somebody kind of wants you to do something, you go, I'm afraid you're trying to take away my agency there. I'm afraid you're, you know, you don't know who I am and I'm afraid to uh, submit to that because it might say that I'm not all that important. No, no, the kind of freedom that God gives you frees you to serve, uh, sacrifice, suffer, uh, whatever you have to do. Certainly, you can... You can model what it means to be a citizen in God's order. So that's what he's that's what he's saying here. So as as slaves of God, we respond to these authorities that God has, has put in our midst. So uh, so he, he he breaks it down and says, okay, here, here's what that looks like. Here's what it looks like when you know who you are as a citizen from heaven. You are freed from the captivity of sin and fear and death, the fear of death and, and, and judgment and wrath. You're free from, free from all of that. And, and, and no, nobody is stronger than your master. God is your master. Your master can whip all the other masters, already has whipped all the other masters, and nothing can compete with him. He's your master. He's committed to your security, safety, uh, significance. Uh, he, he'll protect you. You're his slave. He'll, he'll provide for you. You're his. He, he'll promote you. You're his. And so, you know, it, it's a phrase that the New Testament apostles put new meaning in because prior to this, to be a slave was, was to have a, uh, an inferiority. I, I'm a slave. I'm owned by some, somebody else. And, and so it had a negative connotation as it does today. But when you become born of the kingdom, you realize it's the highest honor you could get. Paul identified himself this way. I am the apostle Paul, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest thing I could think to think or say of myself is I, I'm a slave to Jesus. Well, when you got a master like that, of course, what an honor to be a slave. You see, when you're a slave, you're free from so many, many things. You know, you, you, you know how to relate to God. Jesus uh, talks to his disciples at one time when he was with them, and uh, he's talking about forgiveness. And he says, if, if a brother come, sins against you seven times a day and seven times a day comes to you and says, I repent, you forgive him all seven times. The disciples said, oh, my, oh, my, you got to give us more faith. We can't do that. Jesus gave him a little scenario. So he said, let me help you understand this. If you are a master and you have slaves and they're working for you out in the field and they come in late in the afternoon, five o'clock, and work is done, they're tired. Do you say, oh, thank you so much, slave. 
look, you've gone way beyond. So sit down here. Let me, uh, let me serve you. No, he says, you don't do that. That's not what slaves do. The slave knows that when they have finished working in the field, it's their job to change clothes, get ready, cook dinner, fix it for you. And then at the end of the day, he says, I've done what slaves do. That's, that's who I am. So he's saying, uh, you're my master. I'm your master. I have the ability to forgive a zillion times. And so I'm sharing life with you and I'm telling you, I want you to forgive unlimited times. And so you just do what you're told to do because you have the resources of me. I mean, all that's hidden in there. That's, that's what he's saying. Several things about that old, old text, you know. If, if you understand what it means to be a, a true slave of God, bond servant of God, you know that you can't put God in debt to you by working hard. See, that slave didn't come in in, in, in the evening and go, look, I've worked harder today than any slave on this place or any slave in this count, any slave in the world. You owe me. You ought to, you ought to take consideration of the fact that I have worked really hard. I've made you more money today than anybody could have made. So don't I get something special? So what Jesus is saying is, no. No, you don't, you don't transact with God. You don't negotiate with God. You're not trying to get something for God by something you do. You, you know who you are. He's providing everything you need. He's already given you everything, including his inheritance. So you don't do that. The other thing is you, you don't get to feel superior to other people. You know, you could say, in taking that scenario, you could say, look, I'm a better person than that person who continues to come to me and ask for forgiveness because he obviously is re reflecting some uh, problems. Uh, he's, not, he's not very mature, not very spiritual, but I forgive him seven times. He said, no, you can't do that because you've just done what a slave does. You just do, you're just, you've just done what somebody who's a slave to God does. You're not superior to them. They're a sinner, you're a sinner, and you are doing what God told you to do. So, so what I'm saying here is it's not a bad thing to be a slave, it's, a, it's an honor to be a slave. And if you know what it means to be a slave, then you are free to serve and submit to things that God has ordained for the benefit of the society, not just for you. So he's saying, uh, here are four, four uh, imperatives, four ways of expressing your citizenship, your heavenly citizenship in an earthly fashion. First of all, honor everyone. Well, what does that mean? It means that I see every person as an image of God person, as a person worth God's creating, worth Jesus paying for, shedding his blood for, and equal in the sight of God with everybody else. I honor everyone. Uh, you know what this does? When, when you can embrace that, when you're living there, it totally does away with prejudice and racism and elitism. All of that goes away. People who are worried today about racism, we need to get rid of racism. We think we're going to do it by changing the way we talk or whatever. Uh, the kingdom of heaven has a quick solution to racism. And that is we come to know who we are as image of God. And we come to realize Everybody's in that image, so I honor everyone. I, I can't look down my nose at anybody on basis of race, ethnicity, social status, uh, intellect, uh, size, color. It, none of that matters. We're all the cornucopia of God created by him to express the varied mercies of God. So, so we honor everyone. Secondly, we love the brotherhood. Now, why is he putting that in, love the brotherhood? You see, God, the way God instituted society was that 
the family would be the place where you learn how to relate, how to, to know who you are, not just on, on the fact that mama fed you, but you, you relate to the other kids and you relate to mom and dad. You, relate, you learn how to relate and you learn how to steward things. You learn how to be responsible for your clothes and for your room and for, for your body. And, and so you learn all of that. And then you learn how to submit to others because of the basis on the basis of their, their giftings and their talents and whatever. And so you learn how our relationships work, but the ultimate family, it's not just the nuclear family, not the biological family. The ultimate family is the family of God. That's how you learn to live on the basis of kingdom, heavenly reality. That's how you learn to live in the supernatural. That's how you learn to love your enemies. That's how you, how you, how you learn to speak to mountains and see them move. It, it's, it's how you implement reality on that, that's heaven in its origin and in its character and nature and bring it to bear on earth. That's where you learn. You learn it in the family. You learn it in the community of faith. So, so he's saying, if you want to be a good citizen of the on the earth, which is what God wants, then then you need to give priority to taking care of being a good citizen or a good family member in the community of faith. So, church is not optional. Now, I don't mean going to meetings. I don't. I don't mean following ritual. I mean being related to the people, the brothers and sisters that you have in Christ. That's not optional. There's no such thing as this just me and Jesus deal. No, if it's you and Jesus, it's you and the whole body of Jesus. And, and Jesus does have a body and we relate to it. It's, it's, it's me as a living stone connected to all the other living stones. I'm not the temple. I'm a stone in the temple. And so are you. So so we have to take seriously what it means to live in the family of God and give priority to love. Hey, if you can't love a brother who sins against you, you think you're going to love an enemy out there who, who, who's arrogant and who understands nothing? Of course you're not. And yet God sent us in this world to display him and he loves his enemies. The great uh, test of whether or not you have been born of the kingdom is do you love? If you can't love your enemies, you're not really showing an evidence that you've met the God who loves enemies. That's what Jesus says in John 15. So, so we, first of all, we honor everyone. Secondly, you give priority to love the family because if you love the family, then you can love outside the family. Thirdly, you fear God. Well, what does that mean? It means that, that, that you so reverence him that he is the last word on everything. That uh, once he speaks, you don't have to ask for any more words. Or you don't have to look for any more solutions. That God speaks and God is the final word. You swear by his name, N nothing else. He's the final word. He is the ultimate authority. And, and hey, by the way, if you fear God, you won't fear anything else. Well, who, who's greater than God? So if I fear him, I don't, I won't, I don't have to fear anything else. It eliminates fear. I, I don't fear government. I don't fear, or I don't fear accusation. I don't have to fear all that. I fear God. It's freedom. And then the last thing he says is honor the emperor. Now you have to understand when he was writing this, probably Nero was the emperor. He was a bad dude. And uh, I mean, he made the worst people, worst leaders of our day look, look good. Uh, and yet he says, honor the emperor. Well, as I said earlier, when you honor someone, it doesn't necessarily mean you condone their character. It doesn't mean that you, you model your life after them in character. It doesn't mean that you like their personality. What it means is you recognize that they're sitting in that institution that God created for the ordering of society, for the flourishing, flourishing of humanity, and that you honor them for the role that they're playing. So, uh, so honoring the emperor is not, uh, you know, a lot of people made, made the big issue of this last election about the character of President Trump and the character of former Vice President Biden. 
And so each side was nipping at the other about their character, corruption, arrogance, vengeance, uh, rudeness, you know, whatever it was. It's a sad thing that we allowed it to become a, a, a match, a, a competition between personalities or between the character or perceived character of these people. You know, people were saying, I can't, I can't support Trump. I mean, look at his example. Well, you don't have to follow his example. You know, I can't follow, you know, Biden. He's old and forget, you, you don't, you don't have to follow Biden, but if they're president, then you, uh, you are obligated by being a slave of God and a citizen of the kingdom of heaven assigned to earth, you're obligated to honor. You honor, you can honor through prayer, you can honor by, by getting involved. So I, I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, the, uh, how, to, how to honor the emperor. You see, we, we are blessed. Uh, I'm, I'm not, not everybody who hears this is a citizen of the United States, but most of you are. So we're blessed to live in a country where the emperor is the people. That's the way it was designed. We are a government of the people, by the people, for the people. Ultimate authority lies in the people who choose their representatives. And so we need to honor that, uh, that system. We need to honor that institution uh, unless it proves to be contrary to the kingdom of God. So, so we honor it by... Uh, uh, well, I was talking about who the emperor is. So, 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 what does it mean to? What does it mean to be a good to steward our citizenship on this earth as people who have another citizenship? What, what is what does it mean? Uh, so, so, there's a phrase here I want. I want to bring your attention back to this, verse 13. For the Lord's sake, accept the authority of every human institution. We need to realize you're not living based on your own preferences or what you think or whatever, as opposed to what God thinks. God says, hey, I sent you. I sent you there to live in a way that honors me, that reflects me. How do we live in a way that reflects God? By living as humans were designed to live. I'm not supposed to be God. I'm not supposed to know everything. I'm not supposed to be in control of everything. I'm a human. I am someone who has been created with God, uh, by God, to be his image, to reflect him. Uh, his uh, his word has told me that he he created us as equal, and he expects us to make choices and be responsible for them. So uh, let's look at a parallel, because uh, here's a concern that I have, and I confess my own sin to you. I don't think I've been I don't think I've been as diligent as I should have been in helping to disciple people as to how to be a good citizen of their country. Oh, I've, I've, I've spent my life trying to help them learn how to be a good citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And uh, by the way, it takes a lot to learn what, how that kingdom works. Uh, that's what I'm trying to talk to you about today. That's what I teach all the time. That's what, that's what the preaching of the gospel is. It's saying, look, God has done something to make it possible for you to live like a human was designed to live. And when you live like a human is designed to live, you can live in a structured order on the earth and society will, will be blessed for it. After all, we were sent here to manage the earth, manage creation. So, uh, so I don't think I've done a good job of discipling people because I think probably I let that lie creep in that you can't mix politics with religion as if it's possible to separate it. 
So what we've done, instead of mixing politics with religion, we've made politics a religion. And we've made not believing in religion a religion. How crazy can you be? So, so, so how do, since I believe that it takes diligence to learn what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, it must take a little bit of diligence to learn what it means to be a citizen of the United States. Well, let's see some parallels. Uh, citizen of the kingdom of heaven, I, I need to find out what my foundations are. What is this kingdom all about? Well, it's about God ruling and ruling through his people. It's about, uh, it, it's about some absolute values that never change. Where do I find those values? Well, I find them in a narrative that's given to me to show me how we got where we are, how, how we became the, the kingdom of God. So I have a narrative of God's creation, of man's fall, of God working through years, of giving the law to people and then finding they can't live it and can't live up to it, of how he loved them and how he promised them that one day he would uh, restore everything they had lost. That, that the blessing of the cross would go as far as the curse is found. And, and so, I, I, so I've studied that narrative. I've spent my life studying that narrative. That's, what, that's the Bible. So I want to know that story. How did, how did we get to the place where we are now citizens of the kingdom of heaven now before the culmination? How did we get here? We study this, we study the scripture. What is the writing that determines the final word from God for me? The Bible. It's the narrative. It's, it's, it's God writing down his values and how his kingdom works. Okay, so if, if, I gotta, if it takes that much, if it's that important to learn how to, uh, how to live as a citizen of the kingdom, what does it take to learn to live as a citizen of a country? Well, I need to find out its foundation. What are the, what are the absolutes upon which it was founded? What, what's, the, what's been written down? What, go, what, what determines what you do in that? What determines what, how things work? What determines... You know, how government works and how we respond to it. What determines that? Constitution? Uh, okay, then, uh, then how am I to live in, in that? What, what, is, what, is the, what is the ethic that comes out of that? You know, I am to live as a, a responsible citizen in that country bounded by our, our uh, the, the boundaries are defined by that by that constitution and by the laws that have come out of that constitution now we use at one time we could depend on the public school system to teach our kids what it mean, means to be a patriot what it means to be a good citizen of the United States some of us took civics back in the old days. There, there's been a turn in relative recent years where we don't talk about the foundation of our country being something that maybe God had a plan for and that there's a destiny for every nation, which by the way is true. It's Acts 17, if you would like a scriptural reference. Every nation has a destiny. It's, it's to operate in such a way that every man would seek God. But what, what's the destiny of the United States? Well, as far as just a political entity, we're no better than anybody, but we have a distinct destiny. What is it? Well, in recent years we've been told that our destiny was determined by a bunch of greedy white people who wanted to... Uh, ensure that slavery continued going on so that we could take advantages of it. And so the foundation of our country was racism. Well, racism was a, a part of, of that whole thing and needs to be identified and acknowledged and repented of. But that's not the whole story. That's not the whole story. Our kids have been taught to see what's wrong with the country. And, and we should never hide what's wrong. 
we, we should always be changing and repenting and moving forward. But what about what's right? What was the, what was the purpose of it? And wh what's the narrative that produced our country? Where did we come from? Well, if you know much about it, you know that we came from people who were, yes, they were, many of them were greedy, but many of them were looking for a way to, to express the kingdom of God all over the whole earth and, and, uh, and to find a freedom that God had granted to humanity, but had been taken away by errant kinds of government. And, and so they wanted a freedom of uh, conscience and a freedom of speech and a freedom to, uh, to organize and a freedom of, of, of religion. They, they wanted the freedoms that God gave man, not that government had decided they could have. And so they were basically trying to build a kingdom on earth, a nation on earth that reflected the values of the kingdom of God that they were members of. And so because that kingdom honors humanity as being equal with each other and created by God being an image of God and being valuable, they were concerned about life. They were concerned about all life from, from before, from the womb to, to the grave. They were concerned about it all. And so they enacted a constitution and laws to protect that. They believed that, it, that individuals were created by God and that they had rights to uh, conscience and speech and organization and, and to seek their destiny, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Happiness here not being just comfort, being finding out what they were designed for. Those were based, they were reflections of the kingdom of God. Now, <clears throat> does that mean the United States is a perfect reflection of the kingdom of God? Of course not. But, but what if we taught our kids how to see what's right with the foundation and what's right and what's gone wrong and to correct those things and admit those things, repent of those things and keep work. What, what if we believed in the, that goodness is stronger than badness and that there is redemption for mistakes? And, and what if we were honest with each other? What if we could do that? So what I'm saying to you is that true discipleship, true discipleship, if churches did what we were assigned by Jesus to do as the head of the church, we would teach people how to live on this earth as citizens of a country reflecting the values of being citizens of the kingdom of God. And then you wouldn't have to be fighting over the personality of who's the governor or the president or the senator or whatever. You could be focusing on the, the, the purpose of government and trying to make government do what it was designed to do. To honor people, give them freedoms with responsibility, and teaching them how to relate to each other so that, uh, so that all of humanity could flourish. We, we could put all our energy there instead of fighting against each other. And so I, I believe that there's coming, that, that there's a call right now to church leaders to say, get rid of the lie that you can't mix governmental issues or uh, you know civil governmental issues with Christianity. It's absolutely mixed because if you are not a good citizen of the country you live in, you're not being a good citizen of the kingdom of God that you were born into. And so we need to find ways of doing that that is pleasing to God and will, will help people more than us. Now, where do you start? You say, I, well, I, I don't think we ought to believe in nationalism. We should believe in globalism. No, globalism is a substitute concept for having a mission to bless the world. Global, globalism means that I don't pay any attention to my garden. I look at the whole world and I am... I am thinking that I can 
be a citizen of the whole world without being a steward of my garden. Adam and Eve had a garden. Uh, Noah had an ark. Uh, Abraham had a family. Moses had a people. David had his kingdom. Everyone's responsible for taking care of their allotment. And as they take care of their allotment, then they can spread out and bless those on all sides. When Israel went into the promised land, God gave each tribe an inheritance, an allotment. They were to take care of theirs. There were borders there. There were boundaries there that had to be respected. There were people in charge there that weren't in charge of others, but they related to each other. Globalism doesn't work in the sense that we're just going to be a citizen of the world and nobody's taking care of home. Nobody's taking care of the garden. No, we teach our children, take care of your own room. Learn how to take care of your own clothes. Learn how to take care of your own body. Then we teach them how to, how to take care of their siblings, their brothers and sisters. Yeah, that's a stroke. Then we take, take, how do you do it in school with somebody that's not your brother? How do you do it in a society? If you don't take care of what's yours, you will have nothing to give those who are not yours. And so if we as a nation do not know how to take care of our, our allotment, our stewardship, we will not be able to bless the world. And you don't get it by just saying, I'm, I'm a globalist. No, nope. you are a citizen of, it, of at least one country in this world and you bless all the rest of them by being a good citizen there. So I, I'm praying that we will become better, excuse me, disciples ourselves and better makers of disciples, disciplers of people by teaching each other how to live as people who are born from heaven but assigned to earth. And that's our, that's our goal. So uh, we got a lot to do between now and the next elections. You say, all I can do is just vote. No, you can do a whole lot more. You can be a good citizen in many ways. And uh, it is a shame. It's, it really is a shame. I use that word uh, knowingly. It is a shame that a great majority of Christians do not engage the political system. They don't vote. They don't get involved. They have considered that a part of the world. It's a part of the world you were assigned to. And so we need to get, we need, we need to get serious about that. Okay. Are you glad you're a citizen of the kingdom of God? And are you glad in his sovereignty, he, he assigned you to your country? If so, take it seriously and realize we're crazy people. We're crazy to lot because we love somebody we didn't see and we trust somebody we still can't see. And our, we share the very life of the resurrected Lord. And because of that, we have capacities and potential to do things that we never had before. And we can be a light to a dark world. Okay, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your, your sovereign love to us that you, you let us be a part of your whole plan. You, you made us co-laborers with you. You let, us, you let us work on the earth. And you chose to work through us on the earth. You, not to leave us. Thank you for that. Thank you just to give us the earth and say, see you later. Y'all can do it. Thank you that you said, I'll, I'll walk with you. I'll, I'll be a co-laborer. Thank you, Lord. And thank you for, for giving us a country that we could live in. There's lots not right about it. There's lots that we, we need to improve. But there are some things that are good. We want to give you thanks for that. And we ask you to show us how to be good citizens so that our your name will not be maligned maligned when we tell people, yeah, we follow Jesus. Let, let us uh, bring glory to you by submitting to what you tell us to submit to. Thank you. Thank you for all these people in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, I've enjoyed our study. I hope it's been helpful to you. I hope you won't see it as well. It's after the election, and so uh, we should have given that to us earlier. Well, maybe so, but there'll be more. And it's not the election I'm trying to get you to embrace. It is living between now and then. Well, I'll see you next time. And until then, this is Dudley Hall with Kerygma Ventures. Additional copies of this resource, as well as a wide range of discipleship materials is available from our website. Please visit us online at kerygmaventures.com.